Hi, everybody. Welcome to Big Joe's Journal. My name is Joe Tilden, and I'm the host of this program. Well, we want to wish all of our fellow Vermonters a very happy Indigenous People Day. Try saying that about 10 times in a hurry. And to our fellow American citizens, happy Columbus Day. And to all of our good friends to the north, our Canadian neighbors, and also folks of uh, French-Canadian descent, the northern part of Vermont, happy Thanksgiving Day. Well, big holiday in both, uh, both countries. And of course, the northern part of the state, it's a big shopping day through Plattsburgh and Burlington and uh, Newport, St. Johnsbury, St. Albans. As many of our Canadian neighbors are going to take advantage of this holiday and also the good weather to come down into the states and uh, to help the economy. The northern part of our state, and northern New York, and I would imagine in Maine and so forth, all along the U.S.-Canadian border. Well, what do we mean by indigenous people? This is a day meant to honor the, I would say, more the Native Americans that were here. As you know, uh, some of the things that we accepted as fact in American history when we studied it in grade school and all that are really not true. And one of them is the fact that Columbus discovered America. Well, Christopher Columbus actually never set foot on either the North American nor South American continent. He landed on the island of Hispaniola, which is uh, the Dominican Republic in Haiti. And he also, in a later voyage, uh, visited Cuba. His remains, by the way, are, are buried in Santo Domingo. The uh, Catholic Cathedral in Santo Domingo is his final resting place. Christopher Columbus made four trips to the Western world, and he never did find what he was actually seeking. And that was a direct sea route, not necessarily to India, but to China. Well, Let's take a look at history, the history we studied. <clears throat> the beginning of time, there's some question uh, of how this world and everything came to be. If you read the biblical account, it begins with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And if you talk about a scientific account, it begins with the Big Bang. Thomas Aquinas, great philosopher and theologian, sort of came up with a theory of a prime cause, a first cause that Christians refer to as God and other beliefs as Buddha and so forth. And it was this first cause that created this huge mass that would later explode and blow apart, the Big Bang, if you will, and would create the universe as we know it today with everything in a certain order, everything happening in a certain way. We have our four seasons. We have our planets rotating around the sun. In the early days, the early philosophers thought that the earth was stationary and the sun went from east to west and then circled around and back again. They also felt that the world was flat. But why do we, uh, why do we see history upon the perspective of, um, we'll say, the early European side. Well, first of all, let's talk about the Garden of Eden. The first writing began with the ancient Egyptians who invented what we call papyrus, which is the early version of paper. And they begin to record things. Now, much of what we know I think we know about the beginning, it's what we call tradition. And what is written down, we call scripture. It comes from the Latin word scribo, which means to write. And people who were scribes were people who wrote things down, recorded history. History really began to be recorded with Abraham. Now, much of what we know about Adam and Eve and Abel and Cain and uh, Noah and the flood most of that is tradition. There are no written records of it. 
But beginning with Abraham, and especially with the Hebrew nation, they kept written records. One of the uh, main vocations, if you will, in the, of the Jewish people and the, or the followers of Abraham was that of being a scribe, a person who wrote things down and kept records. And so from the time of Abraham on, we have a recorded history of what happened. We know about the Jewish people going into Egypt at the time of the Great Famine and, of course, being enslaved by the Egyptians over a period of time. We have written records of Moses releasing the Hebrew people. In fact, the Jewish calendar begins with the liberation of the Jewish people from, from Egypt. We have the writings and the records of the early prophets that tell us about the early history. We know about the Babylonian captivity when the Hebrew people were overrun by the Babylonian Empire and taken to Babylon. And Babylon, by the way, is credited with coming up with the first alphabet. As people spoke a language, they had to have some symbols for the words that they said. Well, actually, the Egyptians were really, we come right down to it, were the first to develop what we today would call letters. You put a group of letters together, you got a word. Well, supposedly the, the Babylonians were the first ones to come up with an alphabet. And we go from the, the collapse of the Babylonian Empire when the Persians overran it. We go to the Phoenicians. Phoenicia was located where Lebanon and part of Israel is today on the eastern shore of what is now the Mediterranean Sea, but in those days it was called the Great Sea. It's the people doing the writing and keeping history. That was the largest body of water. They didn't know there was a further, bigger body of water beyond that. And of course, as knowledge became more prominent, you had the uh, Alexander the Great conquering most of the world, went as far as India, what we now call the Middle East. And uh, in Egypt, he established the community of Alexandria in northern Egypt, and he established uh, a library there, probably the first library that created in the universe where all these historical records were to be kept. With the coming of the Roman Empire uh, that overran and conquered the old Greek Empire, went as far as India, we know that Caesar invaded into Northern Europe. Now, people didn't know anything about Northern Europe. Why? Because there were no written records. We know about the Neanderthals and the barbarians, mainly from the writings of Julius Caesar and uh, other Roman uh, writers and poets, Virgil for one, Cicero for another. Uh, Julius Caesar he began his military ventures up into what is now France and Germany and parts of Spain. Um, writes about three things. He says Gaul, meaning what is now France and Germany, parts of Spain. Gaul is divided into three parts. Gallia de Visa et. Gallia in tres partes de visa s. I've got to get my Latin correct. Gallia in tres partes de visa s. Gaul is divided into three parts. And as he wrote further in his journal, he kept a record of his conquests, he used the words vidi, vini, visi. I came, I saw, I conquered. And of course, we know the Roman Empire extended up into what is now England. And in order to defend part of that empire, a later emperor by the name of Hadrian built the famous Hadrian Wall which divided England from Scotland and the barbarians up in Scotland and so forth. But there is no written record about the Neanderthals or about the Huns, about the Visigoths, who we know uh, populated what is now Spain and Portugal. So as history recorded, and European be Europe became more and more populated, more historical records were kept. And as Europe grew and wrote about this happening and that happening, there were explorations into North Africa. 
which is how we know about the Roman Empire in North Africa. What pushed the further discovery of the world was economics. As European explorers pushed further east on the land, they eventually realized that there was more land to the east than they had ever anticipated, and also some very rugged terrain. But they managed to open trade routes to China, or as it was called in Europe, Cathay. And as they opened these overland routes, they found a civilization that they were totally unaware existed, but also a civilization that was perhaps a little more advanced than what they had in Europe. For example, China had gunfire, which Europe had not up to that time. But they also noticed that on the east, Cathay was bordered by an ocean. Well, over a period of time, these caravans that went between Europe and China, they became a uh, rather delightful object for certain unsavory tribes along the way to attack. And it became necessary for these merchants coming back from China to Europe, uh, if they wanted to get out alive and get back home, they usually had to pay a tribute. And that tribute was part of what they were going to take back to Europe. So that many of your caravans, when they left China, by the time they got back to Europe, they might have had 25-30% uh, of what they started out with. So it became necessary, economically necessary, for Europe to find an easier way to get to China. Well, at that time, the Mediterranean was still known as the Great Sea. And they felt, felt the world was flat. But Christopher Columbus began to, not only Columbus, but a number of other scholars began to kind of say, well, maybe it's not flat. Maybe it's round. Maybe this ocean that washes on the shores of Western Europe is the same ocean that washes on the shores of China. And so begin the challenge of finding a more economically profitable route to India and to Cathay. Well, of course, the Suez Canal wasn't there in those days. So they figured the best way to do it was to try to sail around Africa. And much of this exploration of the sea was done in the small country of Portugal. A Portuguese nobleman known as Prince Henry became known in history as Prince Henry the Navigator because he is the one that conducted the various studies and helped finance some of the early explorations that went down the west coast of Africa, finally made it around the Cape of Good Hope, which is in South Africa, and uh, into the Indian Ocean. Vasco da Gama was the first navigator, or at least his fleet was the first navigator, to reach the Cape of Good Hope and sailing around it and say, hey, there's another big body of water there. Bartholomew Diaz followed Vasco da Gama, and he did clear the Cape of Good Hope, went into the Indian Ocean, settled in India, said, hey, there's more water, more ocean. And they brought back this information to Portugal and, and other parts of Europe. Well, about this time, a fellow, he was actually from Genoa, Italy, Italian, Cristofo Colombo, was one of the many seamen that felt that the world was round and that if instead of sailing around Africa, if you sail directly west, eventually you're going to hit China or you're going to hit India. And so he tried to persuade the king of Portugal to allow him to lead a fleet, but the king of Portugal, he was more interested in going around Africa and open that trade route. So Columbus went next door, and Spain had just become a united kingdom under the rulership of Ferdinand and Isabella. And he apparently was a very good salesman because he convinced Queen Isabella that if he could open a direct sea route to China, he'd give Spain a monopoly on a trade with China 
and also with India. So Ferdinand and Isabella agreed to finance that first expedition. And they allowed him three ships. The three ships were to be staffed mainly by inmates, social undesirables in Spain. The three ships, first were the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. And the Santa Maria being the larger ship, Columbus used that for his, uh, for his flagship. And they set sail out of Spain, headed across, across the Atlantic Ocean. And it was a discouraging trip because they really they had no idea where they were headed and what they would find. Some people felt they sailed far enough <coughs> and this was a flat world, they'd fall off the edge. And many of the crewmen felt that way too. And so did uh, the Spanish nobility, which is why they put all these inmates there, figuring, well, we go off the end of the world, we're rid of them. Well, as it was, Columbus found land. And it was the island of Hispaniola. In other words, where the Dominican Republic and Haiti are now located. He thought he had landed in India. He'd come a little short of his goal of China, felt he was just south of that, and he had hit India. Consequently, he named the natives there Indians, a name that carried over. Well, Columbus uh, on a later expedition hit Cuba and so forth and so on. But while Europe was developing and growing, they had no idea that there were two other large land masses far to their west. And they had no idea that these land masses were populated by other people. So who discovered America? Well, obviously it was discovered by the natives that came probably from Asia. One theory says that they may have crossed over from Siberia into what is now Alaska and Canada, worked their way south. But I think a number of them probably came from from China and what is now Southeast Asia, sailed across what we now call the Pacific, which stands for peace, settled one of these islands, these numerous islands that are in the Pacific, and eventually by continuing coming further and further east, they landed on the coast of South America and North America. Well, when we study history, we say Columbus discovered America. We talk about Ferdinand de Soto discovered the Mississippi. We talk about Balboa on the west side of the Isthmus of Panama discovered the Pacific Ocean. And we talk about, of course, Cortez. We know he conquered Mexico. But our History never goes into the fact that when these people arrived here, there were folks that were already here. And there may have been Europeans that preceded Columbus. For example, the Norsemen coming out of Norway and Sweden and Denmark. We know that they hit Iceland because they kept a record of that. We know that they settled in Greenland because there are records of that. We know that Leif Erikson, the son of Eric the Red, who led the uh, Viking expeditions to Iceland and to Greenland, we know that Leif Erikson landed on the coast of what is now Labrador in Canada. And he may have ventured into the inland. There was evidence, or had been, evidence had been discovered in Minnesota that the strong possibility that there was a Norse settlement that far inland. And whatever happened to it, nobody knows. Probably wiped out by the uh, Native Americans who were there, the uh, Sioux, the Lakotas, and uh, numerous other tribes that, that occupied that part of the land. Well, these people had come here centuries before the Europeans arrived and had created nations.
And some of the ways they lived, of course, were rather vicious, but were legit according to the way they lived. But why didn't we know about them? Well, we don't know about them because they didn't keep any written records. It's very, very simple. We know about the European explorations here because it was kept in writing. Many of the uh, early scripts, scriptures that were put together, um, we know some of the, the thoughts of the three great Greek philosophers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. You know that Aristotle was the teacher of young Alexander, the son of Philip of Macedon, who conquered Greece, and it would be his son Alexander who would lead the conquest of the then known world. With the result of knowing that there was a huge ocean and more, more land farther to the west, there were some changes in geography, uh, naming of different things of geography. The Great Sea became the Mediterranean. As Europeans still felt that that was the middle of the world. And that's what Mediterranean means. The middle of Earth. Media is the Latin for middle. Terra is the land for Earth or land. So we have the Mediterranean Sea, which means the middle of the Earth. Well, maybe from the European perspective it is. But because there were no written records that we know of, we view history from the European viewpoint, what we call world history or ancient history. We look at the start of the great religions, which began in the Near East. Tradition tells us about the Garden of Eden. Well, where was the Garden of Eden located? Many say it was located in what they call the Fertile, fertile Crescent between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which would put it in Iraq and parts of Iran. Uh, the earliest remains of a human being have been discovered in Africa. It's a possibility the Garden of Eden might have been in Africa. We will never know that for sure. The story of the Garden of Eden comes to us through tradition. And this tradition was committed to writing the time of Abraham and passed on down as people kept records from generation to generation in the Middle East and later in Southern Europe. And then as um, the Roman Empire expanded and with it the civilization or what we regard as civilization and with it also the great, great uh, religions that began in the Near East or Middle East and spread out through Europe. Many of these writings were consolidated in different languages. For a while, many of them were written in Greek. Much of the, uh, what we now call the New Testament, you know, we have the Bible, it's divided in the Old Testament, which is really the history of the Jewish people from the time of Abraham on. Uh, the book of Genesis deals with creation. The Old Testament, right up to the time of the, of the birth of Christ. And then we talk about, at least on the Christian side, of the New Testament. Well, we know of four major Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're written partially in Hebrew, but mainly in Greek. But around the year, early century, probably in the second century, St. Jerome who was a scholar, translated the Bible as we know it today into Latin. He took the Greek and the Hebrew versions and dedicated his life to translating the Greek and the Hebrew into Latin. And this is what we call the Vulgate, the Latin translation of the Old and the New Testament. The Bible became the most read book in the world and still is, and it was the first book ever published on a printing press. Records before had been kept 
through the centuries by the scribes, later on by the early monks who dedicated their lives to working in libraries, to writing things down, so forth and so on. It was a labor of love. When the uh, Muslim religion came into being, many of the great Muslim scholars continued, trans not translating necessarily, but recording what went on and writing it. Well, with the printing of the Bible and the, mainly the invention of the printing press, probably one of the greatest things ever happened to civilization and education, books became more and more available and people began to read more and more and more things were committed uh, to writing and to history and became part of the knowledge that we have today. Well, let's talk about the United States. 13 small colonies created on the eastern shore of what we, is now North, North American continent. Why do we call it America? Well, there was an Italian geographer, and he was very, very interested in the adventures and the travels of many of these early explorers. And they were all recorded. And so he put together, and he did a very good job. He wasn't that far off the mark. What he believed to be a map of what he called a new world, North America, South America. And his name was Americus Vespucci. Well, over time, he called it America's Map. And of course, over a period of time, America's Map became North America, South America, the names we have today. Well, continuing on, when the Pilgrim Fathers landed in Massachusetts, the Indian chief greeted him by saying, Hail, Englishman. Well, that meant that somebody before the Pilgrims had landed in Massachusetts, and obviously they didn't stay, but they stayed long enough to teach English to some of the leaders of the Native American tribes that were there. And as we know, when our country was founded, and there are people meeting in a convention in Philadelphia trying to put together a government for a new nation. They looked to Europe to figure out what kind of a government they wanted. They looked to England, and that wasn't, didn't really satisfy them all. They looked to ancient Rome, and there they found what they wanted. They found a legislative body composed of a Senate and composed of a House of Representatives. The English Parliament was rather similar to the House of Lords, which was for the upper crust, and the uh, House of Commons, which is for the, the regular everyday people, you know, the lower class. In Rome, the Senate <coughs> was for the upper crust, again. And the lower house, what they call the Res Republica, the affairs of the people, were handled by an assembly of the lower class people. And so this was sort of adopted to putting together our legislative body that we'll talk about at some other future thing because you know I could talk forever on this and time was running short. But I want to use these last few minutes to uh, wish you all a happy Columbus Day. We still have a lot of reminders of Columbus. There's a big parade in New York. Uh, the District of Columbia is where Washington DC is. At one time, our national anthem was Hail Columbia, the gem of the ocean. The Star Spangled Banner did not become our national anthem until 1931. But up till that time, our national anthem was Hail Columbia, the gem of the ocean, in honor of Columbus. So, old traditions, you know, we're, we're learning more and more about history. Things are changing. Some things for the better. In the long run, it's for the better. In the short run, we've got a few problems we've got to solve first. But we also want to wish our good neighbors to the north, Canada, a very, very, very happy Thanksgiving Day. And you should be very, very thankful that your premier is Mr. Trudeau and not Mr. Trump. So with that, 
I wish you all a very, very blessed week. May Almighty God, in his infinite wisdom, continue to bless the United States of America. And we will see you all next week.